Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Dan salam sejahtera. Saya selalu nyamat gembira. Di mana saja saya pergi, negeri manapun, sama ada di Eastern Hemisphere or Western, kita dapati ada ramai orang Malaysia. So the Malaysian diaspora now is a significant force in themselves. And I think they, by and large, uh, act as our ambassadors. Unofficial, of course, but they are our ambassadors. Now I want to explain berkenaan dengan kenapa ini adalah kali pertama saya membuat lawatan secara rasmi ke Philippines. Di waktu saya jadi Perdana Menteri pada tahun 1981, pada ketika itu hubungan antara Malaysia dengan Philippines tegang kerana klaim dan sebagainya dan tingkah laku Presiden Marcos. So we practically had no relation, no diplomatic relation with the Philippines. Jadi saya tak buat official visit to the Philippines. Lepas itu apabila uh, saya dah lama dah jadi uh, Perdana Menteri, uh, tak payahlah nak buat official visit. Uh, all my visits were just to for certain specific purposes. Uh, even meeting President Marcos at one time was uh, only done in a neutral place. But uh, I never visited uh, Manila uh, except uh, unofficially, uh, op- unofficially. So now when I make this visit, I am accorded uh, an official status uh, because I have Uh, become once again the Prime Minister. So this becomes my first official visit. Uh, really first, not a second as min- many people would have thought that during my first term I would have made an official visit. I made an official visit to all the other ASEAN countries but not to the Philippines. So that's why I say this is my first official visit and I was accorded all the ceremonies connected with an official visit. And now, as you know, there is a new government in place in Malaysia. It's a very unusual thing because we have been used to the same party forming the government every time after an election. So for 13 elections, the same party forms the government. Namely, initially the alliance or Perikatan and subsequently Barisan National, National Front became the government of Malaysia. And the people have become used to having this government. They cannot even think of any other government. The government means Barisan National. This is especially so with regard to the civil servants. They have served this party all this while and they in a way feel antagonistic towards the opposition party. Although they were not members of parties, they were not active politically, uh, they regard the opposition as their opposition, not just the party the ruling party's opposition. And then, now they find that this, the very people whom uh, they regard as opposition is now the government. And, uh, you know, the civil service must uh, uh, take orders from the current government. And there they should be no loyalty to other governments. Uh, but I think they find some difficulty in doing this. 
how could they serve the very people who in the past had criticized them. But slowly we are getting around this feeling and of course uh, in the process we had to remove some of the die-hard supporters of the previous government, particularly those involved in a number of wrongdoings uh, together with the previous uh, elected government. Uh, many of them have been removed, retired or put in cold storage. Uh, so we are now dealing with uh, practically a new government uh, and but not only at the political level, but also at the administration level. Uh, the people as a whole uh, find less difficulty accepting the new government. But uh, again, they were at times quite uncomfortable to find that uh, the people they themselves have regarded and always regarded as the opposition now becoming the government. All these attitudes, uh, perceptions by the administrators, by the people, creates problems for the new government. We have to do things, we have to make decisions, and decisions made by the politically elected government must be implemented not by them, but by the, the administration. And if the administration does not carry out the decisions or the plannings of the new government, then of course we are going to have uh, uh, an, an unsuccessful government, a government that cannot do uh, anything. But we have to do a lot of things because we have to uh, correct many of the wrong things made by the previous government. And this has not been easy. When I became Prime Minister in 1981, there was no problem because everything was in place. I was representing with the usual government of Malaysia. But this time around, I find that uh, uh, the government that is... Uh, running the country, uh, cannot sometimes get things done because uh, the implementers, uh, the enforcers are not uh, uh, quite with the government. So we have to tackle many new problems, um, one of which is of course uh, the fact that the previous government has had involved the administration in politics. Actually, members, senior members of the administration were wearing blue shirts and campaigning openly for the previous party. Uh, but now, uh, they are supposed to uh, be neutral and to accept the, the opposition government as the opposition, opposition as the government. Uh, the first thing is uh, to put right the administrative machinery and secondly we have uh, inherited debts incurred by the previous government. Debts that exceed one trillion ringgit. One trillion ringgit. We have never even talked about trillion ringgits before but now our debt exceeds one trillion ringgit, and uh, we don't have the money to pay back the loan, sometimes even to pay the interest. But you know, if you borrow money and you have to pay interest and you don't pay uh, interest, then it becomes non-performing loans. And if you do that once or twice, you may be declared bankrupt. Countries can be declared bankrupt. Uh, what happens to Greece, as you know, because of their inability to pay back the money they borrowed, they, the country was declared bankrupt and placed um, under, well, the administration of the um, IMF and the World Bank. 
So we must avoid that. And to avoid that, we must find money to pay our debt. But of course, if we spend our money paying our old debts, it means we cannot spend money on the people. But the people have been used to accepting money from the government, free money. Bream, for example, is free money from the government. They want us to give them the same treatment, give them free money. But this is not possible because we have no money. Unless, of course, we choose to steal money. But we are against stealing money. That is why we want. So we are faced with a lot of uh, obstructions to, re to help, to ensure recovery of uh, the Malaysian uh, economy and even politics. So that is the, the situation that we are in and I'm sure you have a lot of questions to ask. I wouldn't waste my time talking about something which you probably are not interested in. So I will stop there and let you ask questions and to the best of my ability, I will answer. If I cannot answer, I say I cannot answer. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Tony. I understand there are microphones uh, down there. Yeah, there are one, two. You can also take the one at the podium. The only one that you cannot use is the two uh, on the stage. <laughs> can I have the first question, please? Soalan yang pertama. Yes, please. Hi, if you morning. can, yeah, your name. I'm Pinky. I've been here seven years, uh, originally from Penang. Good morning, Tun. Good morning, uh, Tun City as well, and everybody else. My question is on education reforms. As a concerned parent, I know that in the news recently, Tun mentioned about the change in timetable and curriculum so that we can focus on the quality over the quantity of Islamic teaching on science, technology, and the mastering of English language. This is all very good news to parents like us. So is there a timeline for this to be implemented? If yes, it has been given to the education minister. May I know when it will kick off? Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I was very concerned about the education, about education in Malaysia uh, for a very long time. I find that uh, the products of our edu education system is not what is expected. Uh, we find that some of them have uh, veered away from the uh, kind of uh, thinking that is necessary in this changing world. So I asked for the curriculum to be shown to me. And I was shocked that most of the national school are uh, actually religious, religious school. So much time is devoted to the teaching of the religion so that uh, less time is spent on teaching science, mathematics, uh, geography, history, etc. So now, one of the changes uh, we want to make is to reduce the number of hours for the teaching of religion so that more hours will be devoted to the teachings of other subjects. Of course, all good Muslims must know their religion, but you don't have to spend four periods learning religion, religion in one day. That means you can religion, study other things. That is one of the changes. The other change is to uh, revert to the teaching of science and math in English. However, there were many who felt that such a change would uh, be uh, disturbing to a lot of people, including the teachers. Some, many of the teachers are unable to teach in English. So we are keeping the dual system. Uh, you can choose to be taught in English or you, can, you want to be taught in Malay, that's okay. In Bahasa, it's okay. So that, that well, we have not been able to change but over time, we want to go back to the teaching of science and math in English. Uh, we also want to emphasize uh, learning, the, the learning of English. 
uh, we want to see our students uh, when they graduate would be fluent in the language. They should be able to well conduct, uh, argue, and uh, uh, speak in English properly, give speeches, etc. Because in the foreign service, if you only know Malay, you cannot be sent to many countries. Uh, we may use interpreters, but Malaysian interpreters are not very satisfactory. Their translations are not as good as uh, it should be. This I know, of course, because uh, I understand both languages. And when I speak in English and they try to explain in Malay, their Malay is wrong. I know it is wrong because I also know that language uh, or the other way around. So we must have uh, all our students fluent in English because fluency in English uh, actually makes you more uh, saleable in the market. You want to work, uh, people want to know whether you can take orders in English or not. Uh, so one of the reasons why foreigners come to Malaysia to invest is because they feel comfortable being able to communicate in English. So those are three of the items. Uh, but we, we want also the teachings of uh, the religion must not be confined to the performance of certain rituals only. Uh, the, the, um, the Muslim Quran teaches us the way of life of a Muslim. Uh, this is not being taught. So the way of life of many Muslims that you see in the world today is actually contrary to the teachings of Islam as found in the Quran. Many things are forbidden by the Quran, by the religion, and yet they are done. And after doing this wrong thing, they shout, uh, God is great, Allahu Akbar. But they are doing something wrong. And see, so we have to look into, in detail, into what is being taught in the in the classes. So those are some of the things that we are attending to and of course uh, we are open to uh, ideas and suggestions from the public and if we find them uh, useful, we will adopt them. Thank you. Thank you. Can I have the second question please? Yes, please. Can, can, can the, the next question, questioner, if you like, uh, Stand, stand by at the mic, please. Good afternoon, Yang Amat Berhormat Tun Dr. Mahadir Muhammad. My name is Chelsea Vanessa Minson, and I am the president of the Malaysian Students Association at Adventist University of the Philippines. I am here with 29 others from the same university taking up various fields. We are very honored to be invited to this auspicious event. I understand Tun's desire to improve bilateral relation with the Philippines in trade, education, and health. May I humbly suggest that this includes recognizing some degrees from selected universities, and we would be very happy if it includes our university, Adventist University of the Philippines. Thank you. Well, it is obvious that we can recognize all degrees given out by all institutions. We need to assess the level of uh, the knowledge that they impart to their students. If there is a need for us to recognize uh, Filipino universities, we, if there is a request, we will ask our assessment group to come here and study the curriculum, the teachings, uh, and the effectiveness of the teachings, the results uh, attained by the students, etc. When they are satisfied, then we will recognize. We are not uh, discriminating against any country. Uh, we have uh, uh, India, Pakistan, uh, in uh, Australia, New Zealand, of course, America. But even in these countries, there are universities that we cannot recognize because their standards are very low. And besides, uh, we know all about uh, these uh, uh, degree 
meals that are set up in order to sell degrees uh, to gullible students. Those we cannot accept. Thank you. Next, please. Yes. Tun, uh, my name is uh, Ku Bu Hock. Uh, we met 18 months ago when you visited Manila unofficially for the Phoenix event. Uh, my question to you is simple. Uh, in 1996-97, you introduced Malaysia to the digital economy called Multimedia Super Corridor. And that vision has become clear to all of us that it was really ahead of our time and we really are going to be living in such an era. Today, my question to you, Tun, is what is your vision of the next 10, 20, 15 years for Malaysia in the digital economy? Well, uh, obviously, we have to catch up with the level of uh, knowledge and technology that is available today. Of course, one of the most important things is the advent of the computer, which enables us to uh, gain access to information at a very fast rate without having, to, uh, having someone else intervening or explaining things to us. Now, if you really understand the power of, of uh, information obtained through these new devices, including your telephone, you will learn to understand how to make use of it. Today, many things are done that are based on the speed of information, easy access to information. Uh, things like uh, the um, Apple system, the, uh, all these things, new system including Facebook and the rest, these are available because of the power of uh, easy access to information and transmission of information. Today, I can talk to my children in New York, with, they are looking at them and they will be looking at me. Uh, I could not make faces anymore. And see, but uh, uh, such is uh, the capacity of communication today that you are literally uh, able to be as close as possible to whoever you want to be. In fact, you can have uh, a conference just uh, through using your telephone, your your mobile phone. But we must understand the, this power that has enabled so many new ideas to be realized. And if we understand that, then we can come up with ideas of our own. Of course, one of the ideas that we have benefited from, Malaysians have benefited from, is the idea of e-hailing or the grab. The grab has been the grab would not be possible if you don't have the power of the computer. But there are other things that can be derived from the power of easy communication and uh, uh, easy access uh, to the um, instrument. Nowadays, everybody carries a small broadcasting station in their pocket. That's what you mean. At one time, a broadcasting station would occupy a whole building. But now one whole building is put into your pocket. You can send messages. You can receive messages. And do even more than that. You can actually see people, watch things as they happen. All these things have become possible. But if you don't understand how this works, then you cannot make use of it. Most of us tend to be just users. We learn how to press buttons, and that's the level of our education, our knowledge. But we have to go to the basics, to the invention or the basic uh, idea of uh, transmission by computer, the uses, usage of transistors, the miniaturization, and all that. This we must learn. So in education, if you don't focus on this, you'll be out of date, you will not be employable. Thank you.
Thank you, sir. Yes, please. Yang amat berhormat Tun Dr. Mahathir. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Vice President of Branding Association of Malaysia. Regarding I'm uh, uh, doing the beverage industry, the, these uh, uh, energy drinks, my brand name is Big Power. Okay, we are trying to promote Malaysia brand to the world through these uh, uh, energy drinks. And how to uh, this, uh, promote Malaysia brand? And now Malaysia uh, is very popular worldwide after this election. So uh, everybody know uh, from the previous uh, government. So how to uh, overcome the good name and country brand to the world? Country brand is uh, important. If the country brand is uh, 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 very uh, sounding, then our Malaysia uh, business brand can be uh, go along uh, more easy. So how to uh, rebuild the country brand for Malaysia? Thank you. Thank you. Well, firstly, your product must be good, must be of high quality. If your product promises something and it cannot perform, then you cannot promote your brand. Worse, if you promote a bad product, the country gets a bad name. You know, you know the Japanese. The Japanese initially were famous for very bad, poor quality products. But after the war, they were told that they must produce good quality products. And so they tried and to produce better quality than they used to. In fact, they tried to produce products that are better than other products. Today, we say, oh, it's a Japanese car. Therefore, it must perform well. Why? Because the country has become known for good practices. Whenever you say your product has this capacity, you must ensure that the product has the, uh, the capacity that you advertise. So the first thing about promoting is to be truthful and to produce good products. But if this becomes a character of Malaysia, that Malaysians would not sell anything that is of bad quality, people will easily accept Malaysian products. Or you see, they say, well, this is from Malaysia, therefore it must be good, even though sometimes you are not good. But uh, because you come from a country that is famous for good quality. So it takes time to establish this. Because uh, I remember when the Japanese sent the first car they produced, the, the Prince or something like that, to Singapore. I was studying in Singapore at that time. And they were all running down Japanese cars. They say, if you scratch the paint, you see Milo underneath. It's made by my, with Milo tin. But nobody talk like that anymore. Because the Japanese prove that what they, they deliver is the best product that can uh, be uh, produced by them or even by the rest of the world. Uh, we now look up to German products because they are very meticulous. Japanese, Germans and all that. Uh, Chinese products from China. The first car they exported was called the Cherry. It was a rotten car. But recently, their cooperation with Proton uh, resulted in their making available to Proton a SUV that is very well designed. I have one. I have two, in fact. Not mine. People ask me to use. And the quality of the car is fantastic no longer the cherry. It is almost like the uh, Tiguan. Tiguan is a 
a Volkswagen car. Very nice to drive. The Japanese, the Chinese car now is like that. So you have to build it over time. You can't just produce today and expect the whole world to buy. You have to build up a reputation first in your country, then outside the country slowly. That's how you do it. Thank you, sir. Yes, please. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon. Um, welcome to Manila. I, um, I would like to say that... Uh, your your I, name, sir? Uh, okay, I'm, I'm Tang, and uh, I, I left Malaysia in 1989, and I, I wish to come back. And uh, I, I'm very encouraged by uh, Tun Dr. Mahathir. Uh, in fact, I voted for you. Uh, and I guess... <laughs> <laughs> and, but but I, I used to vote against you. Okay, uh, but uh, now I guess uh, all of us here voted for you, and uh, we are very encouraged. And uh, actually, I intended to sit quietly down there, but I mustered some courage because you were you were telling us that uh, you are facing uh, resistance uh, and uh, your own civil service machinery. Uh, machinery, they are they are dragging their feet. Okay, so uh, I was thinking, how can we help you? Uh? How can we work with you uh, to, to change that? And, and uh, uh, Deng Xiaoping changed uh, China. And he, in fact, the, the Chinese was against him also. He said the, the Chinese need to have an emancipation of the mind, uh, change the mind. And, uh, and uh, earlier, the students here, they were singing a political song. Uh, imagine, imagine if there's no heaven, there's no country, there's no religion. I, I guess the world is uh, racing forward. And unfortunately, the world will probably polarize to uh, two races. Uh, I guess we will have, eventually we will become a race of the winners and the race of the losers. So the race of the winners, uh, they are probably colorblind. And, and the race of the losers, they are always talking about color, religion, and uh, what have you. Okay? So how can we help you? How can, and I, I think all of us sense that you want to change. You want to change, but unfortunately... Uh, in a country where, like you say, we are so uh, mired by the old ways, the fear, and uh, what have you. Okay? So how can we uh, work with you and assist you to make sure that Malaysian, as Malaysian, we become the race of the winners? Thank you. Thank you. We are a multiracial country. We are not only multiracial, we are multi-religious, multilingual, multicultural. And even in the field of economics, we are separated. That is something that we have to acknowledge. Acknowledge the, acknowledging the difference means we must study how we can reduce the effect or the bad effect as much as possible. I don't believe that you can change everything 100%. Normally, if you can change some in, in the direction of good, good things, that should be enough. But when you want to be extreme, you want to change everything 100%, you will meet with a lot of resistance because there are other people who believe in what you don't believe. So today we have uh, people who are, who, well, don't believe that their religion is necessary even. But there are some people who are fanatically religious. If you ask a fanatic to change 100%, he will not. But if you ask him to get rid of some of the things that are obviously bad, I think it is possible that he will accept. That is how you need to manage things. Never be extreme. Always try to take the middle path and to accommodate some while you are discarding, discarding some. I know moral values today have changed very much. Uh, for example, the concept of marriage is almost totally uh, 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 absent in many Western countries. No marriage. You want 
you want to be together, you be together. You don't have to go through these ceremonies and calling yourself uh, man and wife, etc. The whole family system collapse and the children will not know who their parents are. Of course, they will know who the mother is, but the father, we don't know. So, when you discard that, the whole structure of society will collapse. Because now we don't know who could marry whom, whether you are uh, committing incest or not, because you don't know the origins of your partner. So, that is the view of the conservatives. Uh, but uh, the view of the more liberal is that, uh, who cares? I do what I like. But in any society, you cannot do what you like. You may want to walk naked in the streets. Uh, somebody will object. You say, well, that is my freedom. But there are rim limits to freedom. So always choose the middle path. You reject what you can reject and accept what you cannot, uh, what you cannot reject. And that is the way to achieve um, uh, peace and stability and good relations with people in your society. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Doctor. We will have the last question for the day. Sila. Uh, good afternoon, Tom. Um, thank you for all your hard work. Uh, my name is Suyin, and uh, I married to a Filipino. And due to health reason, I wasn't able to fly home uh, to deliver my baby. So um, I understand that uh, today, uh, many Malaysian mothers who applied for citizenship for their children, uh, they just have to wait for years without any news, or sometimes what they are what I mean they. Uh, they wait for so long and at the end of the day, they get a rejection without any reason given. So, uh, may I humbly ask, uh, will the government look into revising these laws to enable a fair level for our children to get, uh, I mean to be a Malaysian, um, whether they are uh, born to a father, a Malaysian father or a Malaysian mother. Thank you. Okay, I'm very much aware of this problem because I do have uh, friends, Malaysians who are married to foreigners. Uh, he remains uh, uh, Malaysian. Uh, sometimes uh, after 12 years, the wife becomes a Malaysian, but there is also a reluctance to give citizenship to the children. According to the law, if you are born in the country, of if one of your parents is a Malaysian, you should become, uh, you should be eligible to become a citizen of Malaysia. But somewhere along the line, I think uh, officers have their own mind, they feel suspicious or whatever, and they do not go according to the laws of the country. We need to look into the implementation. I think the, the law is very clear. If you, are, if you are married to a foreigner and you have children, uh, the children's uh, uh, entitlement to become a Malaysian citizen is because, number one, one of your parents is a Malaysian, whether wife or husband, doesn't matter. But uh, the, somehow or other, there are people who are not happy about uh, this, uh, still regard the, uh, the child as being uh, of the same race as the father or the mother. And so there are quarrels, worse still when they have different religions. So we are looking into this matter to find up, out solutions to the um, non-implementation actually of the, uh, the law of the country. Thank you. Okay, thank you, sir. Tuan-tuan and puan-puan, brothers and sisters, um, that is the end of the Q&A with our beloved Prime Minister. Uh, please join me in thanking Tun 